We were getting a lot of single flight missions for some time. One of my favorites was flying to NHAB, a Navy base. My AC at the time would put me in the pilot seat, and the Peter pilot would take my gunner's seat, and my AC would teach me how to fly the Huey helicopter. I would be at the controls. The idea was that if both pilots were incapacitated in some way, usually by getting shot, I, as crew chief, could fly the helicopter out of danger. I could fly the helicopter in sort of a wobbly fashion. That seemed to be no problem. It was a problem when I flew close to the ground. I felt that I could get the aircraft started and off the ground and fly to wherever, but in my mind I didn't have enough control to hover and land properly. But more practice would help. Anyway, we headed to NHAB, which was a naval base which was on the Song Nabi River about seven miles south of Saigon. We flew to NHAB about five times before. We worked with the Navy SEALs, putting them in places on VC Island and taking them back out sometimes the same day or not. They didn't seem to be in the danger that our Army infantry was accustomed to. So we flew mostly low-level recon missions when not putting teams in or taking them out. To us, it was a break from our usual combat LZ role. We never took fire on our missions there, which did not mean there were no NVA VC down there, but it was nice to not have bullets directed at our helicopter. The first thing we did when we flew into NHAV was to get a briefing of our mission and then head to the officer's mess hall, which had every luxury food imaginable. Shrimp, roast beef, lobster, steak, ham, mashed potatoes, many kinds of vegetables and really anything different pies and ice creams for dessert, real milk and orange juice, coffee, iced tea, coke, or whatever to drink. And they even had indoor flush toilets. Amazingly miraculous to us underprivileged army fellows. My gunner and I were welcomed into the officer's mess because we were Army Huey aviation crew members. They treated us like heroes. Some Navy guys even saluted my gunner and myself because we were wearing flight wings. Too bad we just couldn't stay there on permanent duty. I couldn't eat a whole lot as my stomach shrunk from only eating a little cold sea rations for many months. But what I did eat sure tasted great. Before our flight was to take off, I talked to the crew chief of a Navy gunship that had a 50 caliber machine gun as his door weapon. I asked what he thought of it. He said it was no good and that he was switching back to the 30 caliber M60 or hopefully a mini gun if he could get one. He said the 50 caliber didn't shoot fast enough, and where the gun mount was attached to the helicopter, the airframe of the helicopter was popping rivets because of the recoil of the 50 caliber. Not good. He was right, one only needed a fast shooting 30 caliber for shooting enemy troops. Our mission today was different than usual as we were to find a lost Navy SEAL team or maybe it was a lost LRRP team, pretty much the same thing. The story was that they never showed up for their extraction by helicopter, which was attempted about three days ago. It was a few times when we went out to an extraction place and time to pick up an Army LRRP team in our area, no one was there. The LRRPs were either killed, captured, or on the run from the NVA VC. If they were lucky, they made it back to a friendly fire support base or a friendly patrol. We were so busy with other things that we never followed up on what happened to the LRRPs. So much was going on that a LRRP team getting wiped out was a common incident, one of many incidents. I think the Navy seemed more concerned about their missing teams. Anyway, our crew was doing low-level scouting looking for the missing team. We would fly at about 80 knots looking for signs of broken brush or footprints or SOS signals or anything. We covered a lot of ground flying fast and did not want to get shot up at low level, thus the speed. We were searching for hours when I spotted some commotion in a green area of trees and shrubs. I had my M60 trained on the area as I told my AC that I saw something at 9 o'clock in the edge of the tree line. He made a left bank and rose to a higher altitude as we circled to come back to where I saw the movement. 
I had my finger on the trigger as usual because if it was VC I wanted to hit them before they hit us. Both pilots saw them this time, and they seemed to be American, but why didn't they come out of the tree line? We made a second circle, and they took of their shirts to show that they were white and waved their hands frantically. We made a sharp bank and made a fast landing in front of the tree line. Five of them ran and jumped into the helicopter and told us to get out of there quickly as the VC were right on them. They had no web gear or rucksacks or weapons or radio. Their faces and jungle trousers were covered in mud. Only their upper bare torsos showed that they were our guys. I asked quickly if they were the only ones and they said yes. So my gunner and I started to spray the area with machine gun fire. We didn't know it at the time until we shut down an NHAB that we had a couple of bullet holes in our rotor blades. We could always hear an electrical click over our earphones when bullets hit the airframe of the helicopter, but nothing when we were hit in the rotor blades. We could feel a slight vibration, but that was all. We could feel a slight vibration, but that was all. Anyway, the team we rescued apparently threw away the rifles and equipment and radio as they were out of ammo, and the radio didn't work as it took some bullets. They figured they could run and escape their pursuers more effectively than being slowed down by equipment. And I think that their pursuers were slowed down by checking out what they discarded. I didn't ask if they booby-trapped their equipment. Also, their pursuers may have thought that they did not pose a threat without their weapons or radio. Who knows? They were mighty thankful that we found them. We were heroes to the Navy that day. Nothing was too good for us at the officer's mess and everyone was saluting us. It was just an everyday thing for us. But it felt wonderful that we were appreciated. It lifted our spirits a lot. To us it was like going down a main street in a big city in a ticker tape parade and all the people were waving at the heroes. I just want to point out that an inexperienced crew chief or gunner may have killed the reconnaissance team instead of saving them by shooting before recognizing one's target. It takes courage and steady nerves to recognize one's target. I think this is where a lack of fright or lack of anger comes in. Also, probably an acceptance of death during one's tour of Vietnam. A neutral attitude and a cool calculation of what one should do in any circumstance is essential for survival in direct immediate combat confrontation. It would have taken me all of three seconds to put bullet holes in the five fellows if I were a jumpy, nervous fellow. That's why crew chiefs and gunners had not only to be good at their jobs, but had to have clear and steady minds during stressful moments. Same for the pilots. No one wanted an incompetent fellow on their helicopter. That incompetent fellow could get them all killed or could kill innocent civilians or friendly troops. I heard it said that 20% of Americans killed in Vietnam were killed in accidents or by friendly fire. Well, the bullet holes in the rotor blades didn't seem to cause too much of a problem. So we flew back to our base like that. I would have liked to stay at NHAB and have the rotor blades replaced there, and while basking in adoration, but helicopters were always in short supply and we were needed back in the high casualty areas where we continued to do the dangerous LZPZ and medevac thing.